Hello, everybody. It's uh, Peter Leather here. Thank you very much for attending the webinar. A big thank you to, to Lani in advance, who's uh, volunteered her time, expertise, experience, and interest in, in sharing this. Um, really worth mentioning that what we've asked Lani and the other people doing the webinars to do is just tell us their story. So, got with this webinar, we've got registrations from 47 different countries. That's over the two webinars. So, uh, a lot of interest around the world in this subject. Um, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, according to where you are located. Um, my name is Lonnie Bluthman Carpenter. I'm just going to try to share my screen. Can you guys see my screen okay? Thumbs up. Yes, in the chat. would be great. I've got it, Lani. Yeah, there we are. Awesome. So my, as I said, my name is Lonnie Boothman Carpenter. I am a resource manager for uh, US University of South Florida Information Technology. I have been working for USFIT for about 14 years and I, we've started our skills journey in 2019. Um, and I've been a resource manager uh, for eight years. So some of you may be familiar with what a resource manager done from a project management scope of things, but I'm just going to give you just a little bit of what a resource manager means from a uh, USFIT uh, framework and how, how we use this role. Um, a resource manager is not HR, so I'm not a human resource manager, um, even though I do work closely with HR, with HR to make sure that a lot of what we do is aligned with our HR processes and policies. Um, the resource manager role, how it came about is that we looked at our manager, traditional manager role, and saw that there were some gaps and our managers weren't really uh, happy and our employees who were reported them weren't um, happy at, at all either. So we did some, you know, some analysis and realized that what we were doing is what we always do with managers, uh, we promote somebody who's really good at their job, and then we give them a bunch of people to, to manage and take away the thing that they're passionate and good at. And then they're, they're forced to grow people and direct people and um, focus on the employee rather than on the employee and the work and the strategy. So what we did is that we split the role so that our managers are more strategic in what they what their focus is on because that's their passion in IT. You know, they're passionate about the technology, they're passionate about the application, the system, the coding. Um, they're not always passionate about people. So I'm not saying everyone, some of them aren't. So what we did for this particular role is that uh, my boss, who's very self-aware, says, I'm I'm not good at this lovey dovey kumbaya stuff. I'm gonna, I'm I'm asking you to help me. Um, and, and focus on the people side of things while I focus on the strategy side of things. And we've been partnering, partnering doing this for about eight years now. Um, so the resource management role is really focused on the employee experience and the life cycle of that employee, um, managing that, the workforce strategy of the team, recruiting new employees, developing existing employees, um, enabling organizational effectiveness. Do we have the right people doing the right job at the right time? Um, and can we grow them and can we grow the role and the job and the work? And then employee engagement, are the employees happy? Are they, are they doing what brings them joy? Are we leveraging their strengths? Those different types of things. So that's just a little bit about the resource manager role and how it came about. I'm really passionate about this role. So if you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll see some of my musings about resource management. Um, so let's move on to how did we fall upon Sophia and focusing on skills. So I think the agenda, just to go over the items we'll cover in this presentation, uh, really our current landscape, what happened that was a catalyst for the switch. Um, great, great resignation and silent quitting. I, I think these are some of some terms that have been thrown out in industry and you've probably heard it yourself after COVID or and during COVID. I think we've had a situation where people have been leaving in droves or not leaving and just 
becoming completely disengaged. And then we'll talk a little bit about our skills journey, where we are now, and some takeaways um, since from what we've learned since adapting to skills. So our current landscape. So USFIT, we've always been really focused on making sure that we are driving the technology and driving the innovation that will meet the university um, university's needs and university strategy. USF is focused on research and making sure that we are uh, our students are excelling. Uh, we have about fifty thousand students on our university main we call it our um, university main campus site, and we have three campuses across Sarasota, Manatee, and um, St. Pete, as well as in the main campus on, on Tampa. We also have USF Health that deals with our that is partnered with USF with TGH, Tam, Tam, yeah, Tampa General Hospital. And we have residents and, and so therefore our initiatives span not just across regular students, we have doctors, faculty, staff, students, and we have patients. So the whole university system uh, are supported by USFIT. And we wanna make sure that we are providing the correct technology so that we can continue to serve our clients that partner with us. Uh, we moved to agile methodology in a scrum framework because we examined that we weren't pushing out or we weren't delivering as quickly as possible and we weren't getting the feedback that we needed right away when we were doing projects. Sometimes we'll take time and energy and implement a whole system and then our clients will come back and be like, nah, that didn't work, that wasn't what we wanted. So we, we adjusted and we pivoted how we did things and we adapted the scrum framework so that we got feedback and we got um, information and we delivered pieces and increments and then in, uh, continuous improvement over time. And it's been working out pretty well for us, especially for those project, those burst projects that need to happen within a short period of time. And then COVID happened, yay. So um, COVID created a unique uh, opportunity. Uh, some people would be like, COVID was an opportunity. Yes, for IT, COVID was an opportunity because a lot of the initiatives that we wanted to push that the university was a little resistant to with regards to going digital and not having paper processes, uh, they were forced to adopt because of COVID. They no longer could be on campus. They had to change the way they did work and the change the way they taught students and go online and do a lot of these things. And we had to push out a lot of online solutions for the university really quickly in a short period of time. Um, and because we did that, and I think we were successful, I you know probably need to interview some of our clients to get the real success out of it. But because we were so successful with doing that, the demand for technology solutions increased. So we have a lot of demand right now for us to continue to, continue to build more um, solutions that will facilitate the digital transformation that was sort of forced during uh, COVID. And then one of the other things that was happening while all of this, this technology push and this innovative push was happening was that we needed to have people to do the job. However, we did not know if they had the skills to do the job. What we were doing was just grabbing people from different areas and putting butts in seats. What I mean by putting butts in seats is that we have a gap, we have a person, you figure it out and you do the work and let's do it and get it done. Um, and that worked for a little bit, but a lot of the times employees and the, my employees, I gush about them all the time, they are the best people ever. They rose to the challenge and they did what needed to be done and they learned as quickly as they could and they pushed things out as quickly as they could and they adapted to the, the changing climate. However, we started to have retention issues because even though they were able to adapt, they weren't happy. They felt as though they weren't being heard um, and people started to leave in droves. So I know this is not unique to just us. A lot of people left the industry, left their businesses, their companies, because during COVID, it was a time of self-reflection. You know, we kind of looked at our lives and looked at the uncertainty and was like, am I happy doing what I want to do, doing this work here? So what we did, we pulled in our exit interviews and we got some data and we found that at least 50% of the people who left IT were left because they did not have growth potential and opportunities. 
and that's half that population that's half of the things that we could control things that we could um, influence and make changes for on the screen are some quotes from people who left uh, from those exit interviews you know it was a USF was a great starting point but they felt that they outgrew their role and they needed new challenges and more expert mentorship they loved USF you know everybody seems to love being working for us but they just felt stagnant and they uh, can grow in the in their role. Um, the, the descriptions, the job descriptions were kind of vague, didn't really give a whole lot of information about what was needed from them from a skills perspective. Um, and there's no way to differentiate between do you have a skill or do you have experience doing something, whatever that thing may be, um, and how do we evaluate and they weren't being evaluated for that skill. So that was that was our landscape. So a little bit of facts that I had to go and look it up. I'm like, is this happening to just us? But 78% of employees say that they will remain longer with their employer if they saw a career path within the organization. Uh, another thing that was happening was some silent quitting. Essentially, silent quitting is when people become uh, disengaged. So there's different. there are different levels of engagement. There's being engaged, there's being disengaged, and then there's being actively disengaged. I feel like the, the area of silent quitting was where they're disengaged. This, these are when employees leave, when they stop participating, they're just doing their work, they're just there. They're not giving energy to what's happening or giving input, they just do the work and then eventually they just leave and then you don't know what's happening until after they've left. Um, here's where it's a pivotal moment where we can actually change the behaviors or change from silent quitting to be more engaged or if we don't address, they become actively disengaged and start affecting the rest of employees and being really vocally disgruntled. Retention and the great resignation, when we did the research and realized where well, this is happening across the industry. One of the top reasons, some of the top reasons employees leave a job is a lack of career development, a lack of support with work-life balance, their manager's behavior, uh, unsatisfactory compensation and poor well-being. So, being a state university, we have control maybe out of the five, we have control of four of the things there. And so that means that at least 75% of the things uh, that have been named as reasons why people leave, we could control and we can change. Fun facts, when somebody leaves an organization, 42% of the skills and expertise leave with them so that means you have to start from scratch unless you have really good documentation if anybody knows it developers programmers networkers do not like to do documentation great facts as well um so what happens is that all that knowledge goes with them and then when you have to hire somebody new we spend at least 200 hours getting them up to speed so that they can be start working efficiently so how do we retain, or how do we retain our employees and continue to provide IT solutions? We had to, it took some time stumbling. You know, uh, Einstein said the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again and getting this and expecting different results. So we stumbled through the same processes of creating a role, posting it, hoping that we get the right people, um, reclassifying to existing roles. Some of our IT roles had not been updated for 15 years, yet we wanted the people who were classified in old roles to do new work. So we stumbled through that for a while, but we had to pause and take a step back and really um, take a look at our current situation for employee development and our current situation for how we define the roles and the duties and the things that people were doing. And that's how we ended up focusing on skills. In our evaluation and looking at where we were from uh, organization, we had we realized that from a skills maturity, um, the, these all of these different types of matrix across different organizations that you can test and use to see where your organization lays for your skills maturity and your employee and development maturity. So we went on, on the web and we found out how to measure and what to measure for our skills maturity. 
we found out that we were barely making administrative levels for our skills maturity. So that means that less than 55% of our job um, descriptions were documented, verified, and correct. And it meant that we weren't developing any of our skills. We focus on certification. Sure, cool, go get a certificate and then boom, go do the work. Um, but we weren't developing. We weren't assessing competencies or anything like that. We, had, we hadn't even touched skills. We were just focused on the work. Do this, do this, do this, regardless of if you had the skill to do this, this, and this. And then we had no formal relationship between the organization's business strategy and priorities with the work that was good, that needed to be done. No job architecture, no learning content. Sounds really along this area, this of administrative. What we thought we were, or we, we hope to be is in this area of optimize. We thought we had more than what we had just defined for job roles and skills. We thought we were aligning properly because we were pulling people from other areas to do the work that we thought that were that was defined in the strategy. But when you really examined, like I said before, we were just putting butts in seats. So I'm going to pause right now because that's a lot of background. And I just wanted to see if everybody um, was OK and if they had any questions. And if you have a question, like I said, put it in the Q&A so that we can see. Just give people a chance to think, Lani, but maybe if I uh, prompt a thought that Perfect. I've got. Um, so that, that uh, maturity scale, um, as you said, mm -hmm. uh, you can find all sorts of ones. Was that They're something that you, you've, um, you've tailored yourself or is it something that you've... Uh, no, I'm, I'm, so I'm a, a, a Gallup Clifton Strengths Coach and I focus on my strengths and my strength is not to start from scratch. <laughs> it's, it's to take something that already exists while we create the real right? So this particular um, skills maturity um, model is through Cornerstone. And there are skills maturity. There's maturity models that are provided by Gartner. The maturity levels are provided by um, Mercer. There are different companies provide different tools that you can use to measure your organizational um, employee maturity, employee development maturity. Okay, thank you. And I think Kathleen, uh, you and I both hit on the same question there. So uh, thanks for that one. Um, now let's check, uh, Charles has got a question. Um, mm -hmm. Did you use uh, the RACI model in any fashion? So I guess talking about- We use RACI when, first of all, defining my duties and understanding because it was the change from traditional manager to um, resource manager and a strategy manager. So there was a lot of, what do I do now? What do I focus on? So we use that to define a lot of the duties and who's responsible for what. The RACI model is not very helpful if you have a, lot of people doing the same work but they don't know if they have the skill to do the work right so they don't know how are we validating that they're doing it correctly so we we can we can use a RACI to help people understand their role and their skills levels or even um, assess their skills okay and uh, Michelle uh Asked the question here, how many resource managers do you have compared to your technical managers? Uh, currently, it's still a growing model within IT. And we have, let me think about this a little bit. We have six resource managers. And we have a team, our IT is made up of 500 um, employees or so. And we have, I would say, about 10 teams different types of um, functionalities across the teams. Teams are focused on um, application development fees, teams that are focused on low code development, teams that are focused on networking and infrastructure, uh, teams that are focused on uh, 365. So it's a full shop IT group. Um, and out of those, I would say um, my particular team, because we are about 50 people plus, has three resource managers. 
and we have but we have other teams that would have uh, one resource manager per team um so that breaks about i would say about half of the organization has resource managers okay thanks lani uh, mm -hmm. there's a few other questions but i think knowing where sure. you're going next i think they're, they're trying to talk about the implementation and what you've done and how you've communicated things so great so let's, let's get into that. you get into the, the next bit so where do we start? Where did we start um, with regards to focusing on skills? We had to really, as I said before, we had to, because we were losing people, we wanted to be able to retain the people we have. And because we had such, I would say, niche type of needs, it was hard to recruit new people and get them onboarded uh, quickly, understand the university culture, the university context of the work that we've already done and get them onboarded quickly enough so they could start working. So we had to leverage what we currently had. We had to invest in our current employees and make, give them the tools that they needed to be successful. So we also had an opportunity to tap into our students for uh, to, to mold them into future employees. We have a huge, very progressive uh, College of Business and we have a very progressive College of Engineering and students who are really eager to learn. So we, we can tap into that as well. What we also need to do is do sort of like an audit of our, our duties. We, like I said before, we're just pulling people from different teams and putting them in seats and making them do work. But we needed to figure out what was the work that they needed to do. How has that changed from the work that they did before? And what was the future work going to look like? And then we need to identify the gaps. So understanding duties took a little bit more work than just like, okay, let's think about they need to um, say we're taking Dynamics 365. They need to be able to create some components within the Dynamics suite. They need to be able to integrate with other areas. They need to be able to use Dynamics 365. They need to be able to uh, maybe do DevOps and do con um, continuous improvement with that and be able to roll out effectively using, I don't know, Git or something. So. What we did before was just like, oh, this person knows .NET, Dynamics is based off of .NET, let's just pull him in and, and have him figure it out. No. <laughs> what we had to do is interview the employees. We did not want to, to come up with these duties without speaking to the people who, who were doing the work. We also had to interview the leads. What are our senior developers, our senior um, network engineers? What are they doing? And what, and what was the work that they did before? So we interviewed them as well. We interviewed our directors and the leadership. Where, where do they want to see this? Where do they want to go? What do they think is, is needed in us to take us to that next level? And then we listed out the duties and the expectations. And then we arranged them in order of growth and opportunity. And then again, we identified the gaps. So I mentioned before a little bit that, you know, I don't like to recreate the wheel. So once we identified the duties and the gaps, I wanted to make sure that there was a way for people to do the work. And then we started to think about, so we need to get them, you know, being a university, we need to get them educated. That's great. We get them educated. They get a degree, they get a certificate, but how do they develop that skill of doing the work? Because the work, the coding changes, the system changes, the applications change, the, the duties change. However, the skill to be able to code does not change. The skill to be able to manage a system does not change. The duties may change, but the how do you create a strategy that skill does not change? So what are the constants and how do we figure out, um, how do we map that out to teach them how to be adaptable and learn the skill rather than just the coding language. So I went and I scoured the internet and I saw, I stumbled on, literally I did stumble on um, the Australian Public Service. And I saw that they were, they had a tool that was out there that they were in beta testing at the moment. And this tool, I would give them the most props, speaks to my soul, because what they had already started doing was mapping out skills to their job profiles and their job roles. I digged a little deeper, and I'll provide a link for you at the end of this slide to the Australian um, Career Pathway a tool, tool set. It's open, and they like feedback, so 
feel free to give them feedback if it doesn't work. Um, so this tool actually, as I dig deeper into how, how are they defining the skills and where are they getting these skills from? Are they just making up arbitrary skills? Are they coming up with their own skills? Are they using something that's in, in, in industry? So as I digged a little deeper, I found out that they were using Sophia. Uh, <laughs> scale framework for the information age. It's a model that has been used across Europe, but hasn't been very popular in the United States. Um, I, I tried my best to see what other United countries in the United States, companies in the United States that were using Sophia. I didn't find a whole lot. But being that I'm an international um, person, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago and I moved to the United States, I am very much open to tools and um, frameworks that I use on a global scale, scale and not just focused on just the United States because if the, the world is using it, something must be good, right? Um, so I looked up Sophia and I jumped headfirst into skills and focusing on skills. Why Sophia? What I discovered with Sophia is that they provided a consistent language and a clear description of the skill. So there was no arbitrary um, communication. What, what, does that, what does that mean really from a skills perspective? Verbal communication, nonverbal communication, um, being able to write, being able to speak, being able to present, be able to relay your language, setting a vision. So what they did was actually give you the skill and define what that skill means. And they also give you an example of how the skill is used in uh, from a duties perspective. They address also the level of responsibility of the scope of work. And it was one thing that we, we were lacking is that we would put what like our level two product owners, oh, sorry, level one product owner was somebody who's just starting in product owner, which is a scrum framework terminology, if you're not familiar with it, and give them uh, five teams to be a product owner for. And then you're, like, you're wondering why they're not being successful. I'm like, they're just starting in scrum. You want them to manage the projects of five teams? <laughs> so what, what the responsibility of the scope of work helped um, sort of like frame their areas of influence as they're growing in the organization and helped us to identify, you have this skill, but this skill is only within this framework of responsibility. And as you grow, your level of responsibility may increase. And then Sophia allowed us to have the same language across all of IT, a unified language to speak to a skill. Therefore assessments, whether you move from one team to another team, the assessments remain the same, but the, the skill may be different or the duty may be different, but the language would be the same. And then, like as I mentioned before, little room for interpretation. So why focus on skills? So I just jumped into like, oh, we did skills, yay. Um, no, why focus on skills? Why, why are we no longer focusing on roles and job descriptions and tasks and duties? And I alluded a little bit to that before. Um, when you focus on a skill, you can align the skill to the recruitment process. So when you're interviewing people and you're talking about their skills, you can ask them about their experience doing something and the skill that they needed to do it. So when we were interviewing, say, a Scrum Master, you have... Did you, were you a Scrum Master? How many teams were you a Scrum Master for? Did you remove blockers? However, when we're focusing on something like a organizational facilitation skill, we can look through what does that mean? Are you able to facilitate the conversations? Are you able to have, um, align the team with the, the strategies of the organization? Are you able to translate the technical information back to leadership or back to the PO to make sure that the customer has the right information? If you're looking at something like programming software development level four and you're, and you're interviewing someone, you can say, you know, have you, do you have experience with designing, coding, verifying, testing, and amending or refactoring complex programs rather than can you code in .NET? Do a test. Cool. <laughs> and when they come and they work for you, they have no experience in verifying, testing, or refactoring. So the skill allows you to speak to what the, the, the knowledge that you gained 
and how you applied that knowledge and created a skill to the work that you, you, did, you did. We also use the skills in periodic check-ins with that as a resource manager. The minimum amount of time you should check in on a person is once a month. And we do every other week, every two weeks, once a month, whenever they need us, we check in with them. And we're responsible for performance evaluations, goals, and assessments. Before we were just having conversations about how's it going? What's the work you're doing? Do you need any help? Do you need any blockers? Now we are really intentional about the discussions because now we can talk about, so how are you doing this particular skill? I see that you need some work or some help in developing this other skill. So the language and the alignment later on so that when we're doing assessments or performance evals, quarterly evals, which is what we try to do, it speaks to the check-ins that we were doing throughout that quarter as well as the skills that we were talking about. So they're not surprised that they had to work on something. They knew that they were working on it throughout the conversation aligns and the skills and the growth aligns. And then the other pieces align, we can align learning to skills. Instead of telling them they have to learn this entire role, how to become a solutions architect, learn the entire thing, figure it out tomorrow. No, we can focus on the skill that's required within a solution architect, give them more in-depth focus this quarter, you'll focus on this skill and you'll grow and you'll apply it, what you've learned, rather than the big scope or the broad areas, which allow them to be more focused and, and more intentional on in what they learn. And then it allow, skills will allow us to pivot. Like I said, we are working IT. And I, I know some of you may also uh, work in IT. IT is can, the one thing that's constant in IT is change. So we're always pivoting, we're always changing. Allowing us to focus on skills allows us to be able to pivot and take assessment of what we have and then quickly figure out what we need in order to make those changes and to reuse um, the skills that we have in the industry. Before, remember we put in butts in seats, we weren't actually re realizing if this person had the skill or not. Now we can do a proper inv inventory and see that who does have the skill, who has close to the skill and how can we um, grow them up or grow them into the skill that we need so that they can pivot, we can pivot quickly. So what have we achieved so far? Um, so this, this is a, a iterative process. Like I said before, we do Agile, we do Scrum, we are doing continuous improvement. We're thinking about what we can get out there as soon as possible, and then how we can build on that over time and then continuously evaluate where we're going. So we've mapped out a number of our roles using Sophia. Um, we've identified a tool that will help us document the skills so we can get better gap analysis um, data. Uh, we've mapped skills to the following areas, to employee goals, recruitment process, performance evaluations, and to learning. And we've created some transparent career paths. And then we are starting to create a repository of skills. This is a little example of where we started sort of like our MVP. MVP means minimal viable product. So if anybody uh, recognizes this, this is an Excel sheet. Yes, we started and posting our skills on an Excel sheet because we wanted to be focused on how we were mapping out the duties to the skills rather than on a tool to use. So we started straight off of Excel with some formulas. And this I believe was for a Scrum Master we mapped out what our the levels of responsibility for a Scrum Master was. The gray areas were for the different levels. And then we mapped out what are the skills needed for a Scrum Master and from for the different levels. And then it's sort of like as they got assessed as a base level, we use really simple assessments. One, two, three. Either they have the knowledge and they're not doing it. They have the knowledge and they've applied it. And they've probably been doing it about 50% of the time or less. And they have the knowledge, they've applied it, and they're doing it about 85% of the time. Best way to, to, to judge whether or not they're doing it is to see it in action. So rather than saying, are they doing it good? I don't know. What, what does good mean? <laughs> are they doing it often? So Because if, if they're not doing it good and they're doing it often, you'll definitely see the results and have a conversation about that. But if they are doing it good and doing it often, they continue to grow that muscle and become the strength and they become really good and proficient at that. So... What we've done is mapped it out. And then as we score them, it will create a heat map with the different variations of green. We use green because those are USF colors. All right, so some of our takeaways. 
I really want to mention some of our, our, the things that we learned along the process. Be intentional for what you do. Like I mentioned before, um, we saw that we had a problem. We need to figure out what was the problem you were trying to solve. Instead, rather than putting the Band-Aid on the problem, we, that did not work and we continue to bleed employees. That sounds gruesome. We continue to lose employees over time. We needed to get to the root cause of it. Um, we had to take stock of our current status and we had to have conversations with our employees and keep them involved in the process. We had to think with the end in mind, taking a um, page out of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, think with the end in mind, what was our end state? What did our end state look like? And we had to work back. And then we had to identify the gaps and, and figure out how to get there. We had to make sure if whatever solution we had or we chose, we had to make sure it aligned to the problem we were trying to fix. So the problem we were trying to fix were people leaving because they did not see a path. They did not see their map of their career and where they could pivot or do go. And then when we put them somewhere on the map, they felt lost. They did not, they felt that they were capped at where they were. So they did not think they could grow within the organization. That was our problem. That's why people were leaving. Therefore, we had to make sure that whatever changes we did aligned with that problem. Create an MVP. Don't really focus on the tool. The tool will come. There are multiple tools that are out there. There are Skills TX, there is Saba for Cornerstone, there are multiple corporate LMSs that you can plot in a skill and do gap analysis and do assessments. Focus less on the tool and more on what are you going to put into the tool because the tool is not going to solve your problem. Create your MVP. See my Excel sheet? That worked. I mean, you know, it took a little work for me to actually put in Excel because, you know, Excel, but start small and then iter iteratively build on top of that over time. Get your feedback as you're going through the process to make sure this is working for the team, working for the organization, and then continue to build over time. And don't stop at just mapping the skills to the work. You have your list of duties. You understand the tasks and the needs, and then you map the skills and that's it. Don't stop there. Make sure you're aligning it to your processes. You're aligning it to recruitment. If you are hiring for a level two developer, make sure that the skills are mapped out for your level two de developer and the questions that you're asking that new employee aligns with what you're, what you're requiring from a skills perspective for a level two developer. When that person is onboarded, think about the full employee life cycle and how that employee grows as a level two developer and make sure those skills are being mapped to those areas of growth and development for that employee. So as I mentioned, I scoured the internet to find a bunch of tools and resources that and see uh, how people were doing it out there. And um, this slide has some information and some links about the Australian Public uh, Sector Path Finder, um, Career Path Finder. And it also has a bunch of links that's on the Sophia website. And Sophia is right now on their version eight. And they've partnered with so many great organizations across the globe that are using skills to map out their roles. They even have some illustrative skills identified on their um, star skills. Illustrative roles identified and the, the typical skills that are used for those particular roles. So you don't have to recreate the wheel. Some of my positions, I have to recreate the wheels because they've never done it before, like the resource manager. I had to start from scratch and, and explain, understand what the duties were, and then read through the skills to see how those my duties map to skills. And then I, I use it for assessment and learning for my resource managers. But for a lot of roles that are, you know, consistent, solution architect, enterprise architect, um, those, those roles are already out there. So you don't have to start from scratch. You may be able to start as a baseline for another company, 
how they are using those skills or mapping out those skills, and then see how that's unique to your organization and then take away or add additional skills to that. And then look at how some of the, um, the bodies of knowledge is, bodies of knowledge and the specific um, national services are using skills for some of their frameworks is very helpful as well. So as I leave you today and as I open it up for questions, I'm going to ask you for to reflect on, you know, what are some of the skill challenges you do you think you'll anticipate when trying to implement this type of structure or framework? It's a good thing to think about those challenges because when you you will stumble upon them. But thinking about them now helps you to prepare and adjust and pivot when you need to pivot when you start to adopting a more skills framework. Questions? Thank you, Lani. Um, we've probably got about 10, 12 minutes or so of questions and just give a chance to close things down. Um, of course. The, the question that Lani's asked there, um, we are doing a, a new experiment on this webinar is that we've got a follow-up um, questionnaire coming at the end of the Zoom one. So if you can, Think of your answer to, or your your thoughts on that uh, the question that Lani's posed there. Put them in the chat, but there'll be an opportunity to to follow up on that later on. And the reason we're doing that is we've had a number of uh, people who attended the other user webinars who were keen to keep conversations going, discussion with other Sophia users. So we're going to see what we can do to to facilitate that and hopefully get Lani and uh, the other people on the presenting the webinars to join in those conversations as well. So watch out for that at the, the end of this webinar. Okay, Lani, some questions then. So um, you may not be able to answer them on the fly, but I know you'll uh, do your best. Um, sure. So a question from Karen here. Um, were all the IT leaders involved and were you transparent to staff about the process that you were, you were going through? So we were very transparent with the things that we were going through. I think one thing I did not, um, harp on or, in, or show of is the validation process. So after we interviewed the employees, we interviewed the leads and we interviewed IT directors and leadership about the where they wanted to see that role or that job or that position um, go. We then created the skills path, um, the, created the path using skills, and then we got it validated by our IT leadership. So, so that to make sure we're all on the same page and that we weren't misinterpreting um, the strategy or the future from their vision perspective. So the IT leadership is aware and we try to keep them involved as well as the employees because they're the ones at the end of the day who are doing the work. So we try to keep everyone aware and involved as we um, created those um, paths for the roles. And a related one, I think from Lee, um... What work did you have to do with line managers to prioritize and uh, spend the time working on this initiative with you? I harassed them constantly. <laughs> that was advantage um, of being a resource manager, I guess. <laughs> well, that's the advantage of, of having the roles split too, right? So the fo our focus is employee development. But for some of, the, of our, our other teams who don't have the opportunity to split it into a strategy and resource management, um, I work with them and I provide them with the resources that they need to evaluate and use the already defined skills. And if they have new ones, then I work with them in getting that mapped out and really getting sort of like partnering them to say, hey, you give me the duties and the responsibilities and the tasks and I can help you with mapping out the skills for Sophia, and then you validate, does that make sense? And we just set up working meetings a lot to get through it. In the beginning, it, it's very, it may, it feels arduous, um, but we really want to be intentional on how we do it. And then once we have it um, mapped out, that's why we're really focusing on skills because we don't want to have to remap all the time. We want to be able to, for it to marinate because like I said, the tools change, the um, applications change, the coding language changes, Python, .NET, you know, Angular, those all change, but the ability to code, the ability to um, design 
or think through design systems, the ability to uh, uh, understand how a system works, that remains the same. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, let's get into some of the implementation questions here. So um, I've got a question from Chloe here, um, and it may need some clarification, but I'll, I'll ask it as it is. Uh, how did you find mapping your roles to the seven levels if you didn't have seven levels before using Sophia? So was this so a we didn't, So we didn't map the roles to seven levels per se. What we did was first map out the duties and the tasks to the levels, and then looked at the skills to see, not all the skills have seven levels, some started two, some started three, but we looked at the skill, overall skill name to understand what that skill meant. And then we looked at, okay, where, what level, is this a level two, like I mentioned before, organizational facilitation, no, that starts with three. Is this a level three organization facilitation role or is this a level four organization facilitation role? Are we, when you're looking at level five and six, we start looking at more of a leadership um, roles. Are we gonna give a five, six level to a level one scrum master? We might, because we might see that our scrum masters need to come in off the bat already having this experience and, um, and time and education and application to skill to get started and we can't get started with, with the entry level uh, scrum master so yes but we had to be really intentional about how we mapped out the different levels for each skill to the duties that were provided because we did not want to um, have over expectations for our entry level position we needed to have a, that that clear understanding in those conversations to leadership that, hey, you are hiring an entry level. You cannot expect them to doing level six type um, skills. Okay, thanks, Lani. I think potentially where, where the, um, the questions like that can come from is whether there might be um, the Sophia seven levels and the levels in a, of, of um, roles that you've got. Yes, levels of roles would be different yeah. from Sophia seven levels, yep. Okay, um, now Matthew's got a question, which um, would be useful to get your um, experience with this. So Matthew's saying, uh, what's your insight into how difficult or easy it is to learn about Sophia? For example, how expert you do need to be in the, in the framework, uh, the role of Sophia training for people who are implementing or who are gonna be taking part in your initiatives. So I think it really um, depends. So for us, we, I did a lot of self um, learning about Sophia coming to the website. People probably remember my numerous emails saying that this link is broken, but I did a lot of self exploration of Sophia. And then I found some training. I think uh, there are a few organizations that offer, you know, intro to Sophia training. And um, I think we did ours with Skills TX. They offer, um, Beginning, beginning and beginning level training about Sophia and how to use it and just a deeper understanding about why to use um, this particular framework. And so what I did was I started with that with a lot of our resource managers to give them just base level training about the, the framework and the why and the difference between knowledge versus competencies versus skills and how it sort of like evolves over time. Um, because a lot of people were just throwing the words, I the skill, competency, um, whatever thing that's in industry at the time. So we wanted to make sure that we were all speaking the same language first. So just understanding that. And then really because Sophia is out there, you can go on the website and you can go from skill to skill and read through and understand what each one means, or you can download an Excel sheet and then go to Excel and download the Excel um, version of it and then go through the skills that way to see how you map it out. But uh, I would say that really understanding what it means and understanding the framework is where is the best place to start. And then from there, you can, can as you get deeper into mapping out the skills, you'll start automatically remembering things because there, there will be duplication, right? There will be duplication across um, certain skills that you want to have 
um, as a baseline for all skills. And then you may have for your own organization specific things that you want to have from an organizational perspective as base skills to come into the organization, organization with, um, especially when you're looking at the responsibility levels as well. So a little bit of, of you don't have to be an expert as Sophia unless you feel like um, your the company has a, a lot of, of different types of roles and you think you would need that type of um, skill set to assess and um, evangelize it. IT is 500 people and we are sort of like a, a small business within the you know, global, the university um, area and if you're looking at a full business from a global scale, you may want to go beyond just learning the basics about Sophia and then get some of your people um, uh, trained up as assessors and all those things. So. Thanks, Lani. We're, we're running out of time. So uh, apologies sure. to everyone who's got the questions that we may not get to. Um, I think I can combine a couple of questions here. Um, I don't know how easy it will be to, for you to answer though. So, uh, okay. so a question from Michelle was saying, how do you, do you identify the gaps? And then uh, Charles had put forward a suggestion here about um, if he's understood correctly, employees are self-assessing uh, and he's got the one to three scale that you had in the, the Excel and then managers are doing the same assessment to see yep. uh, gaps. So maybe a general thought on how you've picked up. So different gap. types of gaps too, right? So there are gaps from a skills, uh, individual skills uh, and ability and um, competency area and there are gaps in the organization. So for the gaps for the organization, we've used a tool. So as we've mapped out the skills for uh, people and they've assessed and they've gone through the assessment and we've looked at it with this tool, you can now see, oh, we need level um, three testers or really level three in acceptance criteria, uh, who has it? So they can pull the list of people of who've already assessed or have gone through the full assessment areas and see who has those and who, and then they can see, oh, well, we have no one. So we need to start looking at what are the, what do we have? Do we have level two? Do we have level four? Because we're looking specifically at level three. So then you can look at the gaps and whether you need to grow, grow more of your level twos into level threes, or you need to ask some level fours to step in for a little bit to cross, cross train. So those are the areas where you can leverage a tool to better um, see where your gaps in from an organizational perspective, but where you're looking at from an individual perspective, that's where like um, one of your colleagues replied, we have both a self-assessment um, for the employee, we have my assessment and we, we have an expert assessment. So that employee essentially can send it to a senior level, whatever person in that particular skill and have them assess for, um, for their behalf, or I can send it to a lead and have them assess. And it's sort of like a, a 360 um, scope of the skill rather than it's just a one-on-one -on -one type of uh, vision of how that skill is being assessed. Thank you, Lani. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'll have to close down. I'm tempted to th throw another one in, but I don't know how long it would take for you to answer it. So. Uh, just to reassure everyone what we will do, make sure Lani will see all these questions and the ones that uh, we've not had a chance to get to. And then uh, where we can, we'll get a response um, to the questions. And what we do with the, the um, webinar, we've got it recorded. Uh, we will post the recording, we'll hopefully get the slides, get them posted, and we'll pick out some of these questions and the key learning points and put that on a, on a web page for everyone to, to get back to. Yeah, great. It was Great talking to everyone, you know, follow me on LinkedIn. I have a very unique name, so it's not very hard to find. Um, and I'll be happy to also answer any questions there as well. Thank you for that offer, Lani. And uh, it, it's been a real benefit of doing these uh, webinars that people have been able to ask questions of the of people, real people doing real things with Sophia. So that makes a big difference. So just to remind you, if you're leaving the, the, the Zoom, um, there's a, a, a Zoom screen will come up with a little link on it. And if you are interested in uh, taking part in further discussion, just on an informal basis, um, please put your details in there. Uh, we'd love to hear from, and uh, you know, this really works as a mechanism of engaging people in, in Sofia. 
So I'll just add, add a, a really big thank you to Delaney. Um, it was uh, such an authentic story. You could see the, the pain and pleasure of going through your experience here. So uh, it, it, it uh, worked really well for me. So thank you very much for doing that. And uh, we'll see you again in about uh, 12 hours or something like that. We'll do yep. it all again. Yep. Brilliant. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.